So these are soybeans, same irrigation treatment. Okay, in this case, we had that sustained soil moisture for about oh, for about four weeks, uh, up until about canopy closure. By that point, July 28th, uh, pretty much, well, all of these had, were at R2 to a certain extent. Things were delayed this year. Uh, we, these got planted a little on the later side, just because of the nature of the season, but it wasn't terrible. I think they were planted May 29th or something. Okay, but uh, anyhow, by, by we maintain consistent soil moisture into canopy closure in R2, and we have 14 varieties in here. Now, the first thing I want, to, want you to see is you'll see immediately that your variety matters for sclerotinia management. It matters enormously. Okay, you'll see that there are a lot of varieties here that look really great, and then you look at this guy. Holy cow, that guy's obliterated. And that was under a really, um, you know, our easiest irrigation regime here. Okay, and so for reference, you see that really shiny green one back there? I just did these notes on that one across the trial, across all six reps, and that was at 3% incidence. That one probably about 90. <laughs> okay, and uh, so varieties matter. All companies have disease scores. Uh, most companies have disease scores for white mold. Okay, now what I want to tell you is that from our testing, uh, those white mold scores have always been informative within the portfolio of that company. Now, how good that variety is varies dramatically. Sometimes you get a 10% reduction of white mold with that variety relative to a similar variety from that same company of the same maturity or similar maturity. Okay, uh, that's rated as more susceptible. Sometimes it's like a 90% reduction. And it's really hard to predict it from their scores. Okay, and so one of the things that we're doing in here is that we have been taking very detailed notes across the season relative to the growth characteristics of these soybeans. And resistance to white mold in soybeans in particular is not the same as, say, resistance to rust in dry beans. Resistance to rust and dry beans is conferred by a single gene. You got the gene, you're, you're immune. Okay? Resistance to white mold in soybeans is conferred to a great extent by the growth characteristics of the plant. I.e., one plant has this really dense canopy. It traps in lots of, lots of uh, if you have a rainfall event, it traps that moisture under there. It doesn't let much air flow through. It's really favorable for disease development just because of the way the plant grows. Okay? Not to say that there isn't any genetic resistance, but the genetic resistance often is less important than actually how the plant grows. And so what we are doing here is we are looking at the growth characteristics that predict, that help predict the performance of the variety. So that if you know how a particular variety grows, you can have a better, again, gut sense, get back to that term, right, on how well that resistance might perform. Because you know, you know as well as I do that if I tell you that variety X works great because we just tested it for three years, that's not going to help you a bit. Because most varieties are on the market for what, three years, right? So we're done testing that commercial variety for three years. We're really confident about, about its performance and you're like, oh, sorry, we're not selling that one anymore. So, so you, need to have, uh, you need to have an idea about the growth characteristics. And that's what we're working on uh, in conjunction with our other work. But anyhow, other big question on soybeans now is if you're going to apply a fungicide, and this is usually a question for irrigated producers. Okay, dry land, sclerotinia is usually not sufficiently economical to worry about fungicides. Okay, uh, resist resistant variety might help you if you have a history, but usually it's not sufficiently economical. But irrigated, a lot of times it's really economical, especially a year like this one where the temperatures are cool. Okay, and, uh, and worse if you're on sandy soil and have to irrigate frequently because you know already what happens when you irrigate frequently. So then the big question is what do you, wh what do you, what do, you do? And what we have found is that among registered fungicides, the only thing that reliably works is Endura on soybeans. Dry beans you have more options, but on soybeans the only thing that's registered that reliably works is Endura. And it's labeled from 5.5 ounces an acre up to 11. And there's a rate response. I don't want to belabor the point here, but basically what we have tested here, and some of the signs fell off in the wind, is that we tested a single shot at 5.5 ounces an acre at uh, the early R2 growth stage, and a single shot at 8 ounces an acre, and two shots separated by about 12 days or so, or 14 days, uh, and at 5.5 ounces an acre. Okay. And the big take home here is that, just eyeballing it, I haven't taken the notes yet, under this uh, relatively uh, lower disease pressure environment, irrigation every nine days, 
That 5.5 ounces an acre at a single shot of early R2 works, seems to work quite well. And uh, over there on the contents experiment, that's what we used. And we got great control, okay? And as we go along here, what you'll see is that under higher disease pressure, that might not do as well. The other caveat that I'll give you is that this testing is being done on a variety that does not look as susceptible as, say, that one. It's an intermediate susceptibility. If we use it on a real dog, we test it on a real dog like that variety, then, uh, you know, it might have a different answer for you. So you might have to go with eight ounces. Really, what you'll see here, this is the irrigation every six days. Okay, here's your control. There's a single shot right behind you at 5.5 ounces an acre where that sign's turned around. You can see that your 5.5 ounces an acre is still giving you pretty good control. Okay, now look at how much more the disease went up. Your 14 varieties are spaced between these two signs. You can see the disease, irrigating every six days, your disease went up a lot. Now let's go on forward to irrigation every three days. What you, what you see here right now is that soybeans really respond to the frequency with which rainfall occurs or irrigation is applied. They, ex ex they respond tremendously. I mean, this is obliterated, right? And it's not just a couple varieties anymore. Okay, and, uh, and, but even then, some of the really resistant varieties do hold up. That one variety that was at 3% in that first block is that out here is only, it was only at 15%. Okay, so some of the varieties will really hold up. But again, how do you know that if a variety is going to be that good? You don't know. The big thing is, is look at this, 8 ounces an acre works really quite well. Your check, I, for, I forget where it is, it looks awful. It's obliterated. 5.5 ounces an acre was also obliterated here. Okay, so under this type of high pressure environment, the eight ounces seem necessary. I haven't done the numbers. We'll have those results posted online here this winter. And, uh, but at least eyeballing plots. Uh, it's, it seemed like as you get into higher disease pressure, you need to, you need to make that investment to uh, make it pay off for yourself, uh, the fungicide app. Okay, uh, with that, I'll take questions. Regarding your earlier comment about the importance of growth characteristics of the plant for disease, is the growth morphology not genetically predetermined? Okay, so the question is about uh, the genetics. Uh, basically, I indicated that growth characteristics were very important for uh, the susceptible of a soybean variety to sclerotinium. And he's asking if that's genetically determined, and yes, it is. And I apologize for any confusion there. Uh, but what I'm trying to, what I was trying to say about gen genetics is that those are genes that control basically how the plant grows. They're not specifically genes that serve no function except disease control. Okay, if you take a rust resistance gene, as far as I'm aware of, the single purpose of that is disease control. Okay, and uh, in this case, this is, this is just the suite of genes that controls how that plant grows. And the suite of genes, the way they are arranged, happens to produce a plant that allows quite a bit of airflow at the critical windows to uh, mean that you get, uh, that you have an environment less favorable for sclerotinia to get established. Okay, the big thing here is that the research done in other areas has suggested that you need about 40 hours, 40, 40 hours of sustained canby humidity to get sclerotinia. And that's because sclerotinia is an unusual disease. Okay, uh, the spores have to land on dead tissue and colonize that dead tissue. And once they have enough of a colony on that dead tissue, then they, it, then they have the energy to punch through into the living tissue. Okay, and so this isn't like a normal disease. A normal disease, the spore lands on a leaf, the, the plant is susceptible, it, 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 it germinates and it, it, it invades that leaf, right? Not here. Here it's got to land onto dead tissue, it's got to colonize that, and then it has the reserves, it has the energy that it can punch through. It's basically a running start. But the only way that's going to happen is if that dead tissue remains moist for quite a while. Okay, and so that's why here growth characteristics matter. Because if you have a variety that in that critical window in early bloom, okay, early to mid bloom, that allows a lot of airflow through, it can dry out quite a bit in there, and that dead tissue, the dead blossoms, or mostly dead blossoms, okay? That's, what we, that's where most of the disease comes from. Okay, um, gets a chance, get a chance to dry out. Okay, and even if that spore landed on there and germinated, if it desiccates before it had enough of a colony there to punch through, then your sclerotinia is toast. Okay, and that's why growth characteristics matter. Now, don't get me wrong, there are some genetic factors that also contribute to resistance here that perhaps aren't growth, aren't 
uh, you know, related, aren't exclusively like plant morphology, okay? It's just that they're all small effects, okay? Not like one gene that confers immunity, okay? Yep, next How question. effective is row spacing like uh, plant and even 20 or 30 inch rows versus drilled solid seeded? I mean, how effective is that? Then now, we have we have acres of trials that are looking at that in conjunction with other, uh, with other management strategies. Literally, acres, okay? And so we're getting a rigorous answer to that. Okay. Uh, the basic thing is, from what I have seen, it matters when your rainfall occurs and how long it lasts. One of the things that you need to be aware of is that the wide rows help you, say a 21 or 30 inch row helps you, because you get more airflow early in crop development, which dries out your canopy in that critical early window, right? But if you keep your plant population the same as, say, a narrow row spacing, if you get hammered with lots of moisture end of the season, all your plants are super close together, right? Well, sclerotinia, I uh, goes it has a lot of plant to plant movement of disease. Uh, you get a d disease plant and then you get a windstorm and you get lodging. Well, the disease plant is going to lean up right against another healthy plant and the plant and the disease will move plant to plant. And so under that situation where you have say extended period of cool moist weather towards the end of the season, those uh, wide rows can come back to bite you. So it, I think from what I have seen thus far is that it matters how the um, how the rainfall occurs, or the irrigation occurs. Okay, and uh, so, I, but we're gonna we're gonna have a better answer from that as we go forward. What I think is really critical here is that if you go with those wider row spacings, that you don't have your seeding rate too high, because you don't want tons of spindly plants that lodge really easily right next to each other. Okay, um, and uh, because that's that's really high risk for late season sclerotinia. And you might think late disease onset, oh, it's not going to take much yield, but I tell you what, if, if your plants end up like a big disease mat like that, you're not going to, in patches of your field, you're not going to pick up a lot of beans, even if they, if they set some seed.